My paper is essentially an overview of Twain's extant notebooks from his years in the West. The earliest of these notebooks is known as Notebook 4, which Twain initially used while on the lam with his friend Steve Gillis between early December 1864 and late February 1865 at Jackass Hill and Angel's Camp in two alumni in Calaveras Counties, California, a few hours north of San Francisco. One mysterious entry in the notebook, made some time after, and I apologize for the faint um, graphite traces here, very hard to read, but that's just how they look. Um, the <laughs> pencils that were cheap and available, as I'll say later in this paper at the time, were pretty bad um, and didn't have much graphite in them. So um, that's basically what you would see if you were in the reading room at MTP. Um, one mysterious entry in the notebook, made sometime after February 6th and before February 20th, 1865, reads, quote, Bunker's great landslide case of Dick Sides versus Rust. Rust's ranch slid down on Sides' ranch, and the suit was an ejectment suit tried before Gov Group as judge referee, who gave a verdict in favor of defendant, unquote. I say that this entry is mysterious because the circumstances under which it was made were especially unclear. It almost certainly was not made in the famous one-room cabin on Jackass Hill, the cabin Dan DeQuill would refer to as the headquarters of all Bohemians visiting the mountains, where Twain and Steve Gillis were hosted on their exurban jaunt by Steve's brothers Jim and William and their mining partner Dick Stoker. Given the approximate date of the entry, it was most likely written down at Angel's Camp, perhaps in the tavern at Tryon's Hotel, where Twain and Jim Gillis would play billiards and, one fateful evening, hear the bartender Ben Kuhn tell a funny story about a jumping frog. The jumping frog story would become an entry in Notebook 4, too. And we know how and why. It was a good story, Twain heard it, and he wrote it down. But this other entry is different, because this entry summarizes an anecdote that he had already published as a subsection of a letter for the San Francisco Morning Call over one year before, on August 30th, 1863, titled A Rich Decision. Twain expanded the anecdote into a standalone story titled The Facts of the Great Landslide Case for the Buffalo Express of April 2nd, 1870, and then he revised the express version of the entire, uh, for the entirety of chapter 34 of Ruffing. So we may safely assume that the entry from Notebook 4 had nothing to do with the anecdote's first printing as a subsection of the Morning Call letter published over a year before the entry was made. But what role could the telegraphic recollection of the anecdote in his mining camp notebook have played in its expanded, and I might add, increasingly embellished versions in the Express and Roughing? Why did he even scribble the anecdote in that notebook at all, between sessions of billiards and storytelling with his fellow travelers and other denizens of Angel's Camp? My theory is that the summary of a rich decision shows us Twain attempting to update the writer he had been by integrating his previous writings with a writing practice that he had begun to develop in Notebook 4, a practice inspired in part by what he saw and heard at Angel's Camp and Jackass Hill. Notebook 4 is not only, as the editors of the text edition rightly state, the first that can accurately be considered a writer's notebook. It is that notebook because it is the first notebook that we know of that shows us Twain submitting himself to an experimental documentary writing practice. The first step in the development of this practice was the relocation of his work from stable contexts for drafting copy to transient contexts and social milieus that would deform his grammar, syntax, and diction. Breaking down in transit, his writing methods and style could evolve in relation to the circumstances of the moment, giving his writing the feel of common experience and the texture of American vernacular. Such distinctive effects were exactly what would set the facts of the Great Landslide case in 1870 and Chapter 34 of Roughing in 1872, apart from their predecessor, A Rigid Decision, from 1863. Between them, we have these notebooks. Twain would have certainly derived this documentary practice from the exigencies of on-the-spot journalism, but the notebooks show us how he turned the type of journalism he had been writing into something else, recording ideas and sensations for their own sake, rather than for the purpose of an assignment. These wild traces had a broad, significant impact on the development of Twain's aesthetics, and in this way, they tell a story that runs parallel to the story told in Roughing It, which is also, in one sense, the story of Mark Twain's forays into journalism and his turn to professional authorship. 
This two-page spread from Notebook 4 documents the various writing methods Twain used while traveling between Angel's Camp and Jackass Hill. On the verso, he recorded his New Year's Eve 1865 celebration in Valcito between Angel's Camp and Jackass Hill, which involved a woman cursing out his traveling companion, William Gillis, in the middle of the page. G-D-B-G-L-S. G-D-B-G. On the recto, after he made a diary entry noting his return to Jackass Hill from Angel's Camp on January 3rd, he made two more entries with a combination of longhand and half-learned shorthand, the first noting the types of books wanted in mining camps, Byron, Shakespeare, Bacon, Dickens, and the second noting the tragedy and the burning shame, which of course he later used in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Notice that the list of great authors of every kind of only first-class literature that Twain inscribed in the middle of the recto is not necessarily written in Twain's voice. His fractured attempt to use shorthand to write down not only what people say, but how they say it, suggests that this list of great authors recorded on the recto was a transcription as well as an inscription. This documentary technique evolved in Notebook Four's later entries after Twain returned to San Francisco, where he continued to write down what he thought, heard, and saw while in transit around the city. Fragments at the bottom of page 37 report offensive barroom phrases, had a breath like a buzzard, the blank old sow, part of Twain's growing collection of popular and decidedly not parlor speech that infused his work. I don't mean to suggest that he had never used language like this before in his previous newspaper writings. Rather, I'm saying that Notebook 4 provides early evidence of his compilation of such phrases in this fragmented and list-like fashion. These entries indicate the cultivation of a writing practice that he could have only developed in his notebooks in the mid-19th century, before, for instance, the introduction of portable sound recording devices. Lacking such equipment, he anticipated its use with his pocket notebook and pencil, the era's portable recording media, which allowed him to compile common speech and episodes taken from life that lay beyond the boundaries of middle-class propriety. The notebooks that followed Notebook 4 suggest that Twain continued to develop this documentary practice with portable media, fortunately with better graphite quality pencils this time. Notebook 5, which Twain used on his Hawaiian trip, contains numerous examples of inscriptions that have a gestural quality suggesting that he wasn't gathering material after the fact, but on the move and in the moment. The erratic and uneven lines of the entry on pages 34 and 35 are not the stable inscriptions of an author at his desk, but the notes of a roving reporter with the aims of a modern proto-ethnographer. The inscription that begins at the bottom of the verso and continues at the top reads, quote, Horse begin to blank like a thunderstorm, and in 15 minutes, cinch would hang down three inches below horse's belly. Another blast like that, and I'll have to get down and cinch him again. The gestural quality of the inscriptions corresponds to their agrammatical abbreviation, all in the endeavor to get the event and the quotation down then and there, and to capture the vulgar humor in the words of their articulation. The gestural quality of such inscriptions reappears in Notebook 6, another Hawaii notebook. Page 129 exhibits the contrast between writing sensation on the spot and recollecting story material at a desk. The top of the page captures an observation in the form of extemporaneous speech. Darkest country and world when moon don't shine, which contrasts with reading notes on a biography of Kamehameha I by King David Mela below it. The last notebook from the period recounted in Roughing It is Notebook 7, which Twain used during his voyage from San Francisco to New York between December 15, 1866 and January 12, 1867 on the Steamship America. In this notebook, we find the extended recording of an event as it played out in real time. On the verso of this page spread, page 50, Twain began to write about Christmas Eve aboard the America. By the time he reached the recto, page 51, his handwriting loosened as he began to record dialogue between actors in the episode. Twain's handwriting devolved further and his gesture further loosened as he tried to keep up on pages 52 and 53 with the action as it unfolded. There is a momentary break in the middle of the recto about sea life, as one might do on a ship, um, and then the festivities conclude between the bottom of page 53 and the top of 54. My goal in showing you these images is, in part, to share this alternative yet parallel st story of Twain's development as a writer in his notebooks. It is not a story of a Western adventure so much as it is the story of a writer whose inspired decision to write as a transient 
to be shaped by his itinerancy, trained him to imbue his prose with the texture of common experience all, in all its comedy and banality. I also want to impress upon you how these images convey significant information about the writing materials in use and the inscriptions those materials afford. Writers have found use for portable notebooks for centuries, of course, but only recently in the US were literacy rates and cultural incentives to record, record one's thoughts high enough to make ready-made pocket notebooks cheap, widely available, and thus standard equipment for the literate and aspiring middle classes, Twain included. Pencils, too, had existed for centuries, but not in the cedar-encased processed graphite form that Twain used between 1864 and 1867. Before the 1840s, American pencils were either affordable and unusable, as you saw earlier, <laughs> or expensive and highly practical. In early America, quality pencils were designed for and marketed to specialists, not scribblers like Twain. A uh, good example of this is actually the Thoreau family pencils, which were expensive. For some of the same reasons that ready-made notebooks became standard equipment in the mid-19th century US, American pencils became affordable and popular equipment mere decades before Clemens began filling notebook four. When placed in their material context, the extent notebooks dating from the period recounted in Roughing It show us that Twain depended on modern writing equipment to develop the writing practices that would transform him into a modern American author. Pencils and pocket notebooks were not the equipment of a private writer cultivating material for public consumption, but of a public writer whose pencils and pocket <coughs> notebooks allowed him to record the events around him, deform his lines of prose, smear and extend his cursive, mutating his inscriptions beyond the ruled lines and looped forms of standard cursive. And how am I doing on time? A couple more minutes. A couple more minutes? Is that enough, maybe? Okay. <laughs> Let's give it a try. <laughs> so, Carl, you want to finish? Drum roll, please. Fantastic. Okay, so, because I'm, I wanted to finish with this because, you know, I'm basically you know, showing you stuff that you probably have only seen in Berkeley, and now we have scans of this stuff and we want to make it available to the public, but we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So I've been working on a prototype that would, you know, based on some of the framing I provided in my paper, paper sort of foreground the holograph manuscript, put that first, the materials first, the way it looks first, and then have the wonderful transcriptions that have been prepared already by the Mark Twain Project follow with these hovers that, you know, pop, pop at the top. And um, if you see an uh, image, a little icon of Twain writing his jumping frog, you hover over that and it gives you the annotation. Because for those of you who are familiar with the notebooks, the, the critical text of the notebooks, like more than half the page usually is, is annotation. <laughs> um, and so often, you know, um, uh, that sort of, you know, blocks out even the transcription. This gives you the opportunity to go between um, the rich annotation that sometimes just covers, you know, 10 words <laughs> that, that Twain wrote down. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can always sort of go back and, you know, if you go away so that there's no hovering, you can just look at the holograph. And so and so, so that's I wanted to finish here, um, uh, even though I've, I've derailed our, our uh, projector and um, PowerPoint <laughs> setup um, momentarily, um, so that you know we're working on stuff to make these available, um, hopefully in as best possible form um, as we can. So thank you very much. For your <laughs>